You can see why the early part of the 20th century was a confusing time for scientists. The whole picture of science wasn't hanging together. It's almost as if nature was lying to us, first telling us one story, then telling the other. Physicists really were puzzled. The situation was hugely clarified in 1905 when Albert Einstein published one of his seminal papers. 1905 was an incredible year for Albert Einstein. For one, it was the year that he got his PhD from the University of Zurich. But his PhD was small potatoes. This year is called his Annus Mirabilis, or Miracle Year, for he published not one, but four groundbreaking papers, including a paper on Brownian motion to demonstrate the existence of atoms, and two on his theory of special relativity and the equivalence of mass and energy. But the Einstein paper we're interested in here explained the reason why some wavelengths cause electrodes to spark while others don't. This is called, quite reasonably, the photoelectric effect. Here is how Einstein solved the problem. He imagined that light was actually a particle, but a particle of light that retained a little bit of its wave nature. Einstein called these particle light quanta, but we now call them photons, a name we have thanks to chemist Gilbert Lewis in 1926. Anyway, Einstein began by observing that the energy of the photons are proportional to their frequency. Specifically, the relationship is E equals HF, where E means energy, F means frequency, and H is Planck's constant. Now, this idea of relating energy and the frequency of light didn't originate with Einstein. In fact, Max Planck had proposed a variation of the idea in 1900 in order to explain some mysteries that arose when people studied the color of objects heated until they glowed. But Einstein used the idea in a novel way, and it explained the observed relationship between sparks and the color of light that hit the electrodes. The basic idea is pretty simple. Remember that the electrodes were made of atoms, and atoms are surrounded by electrons. For the moment, you can think of atoms as a little like a solar system, with a nuclear sum and planetary electrons. The electric field of the nucleus holds onto the electrons with a certain force, or equivalently, a certain amount of energy. More to the point, it requires a certain amount of energy to pull an electron off the atom. And that was the key insight. If Einstein was right, and the energy of the photon was proportional to the frequency, then only light with enough energy could knock electrons off the electrode. That means that only high-frequency light could cause a spark, and the whole thing was explained. And that was really very cool. And all this showed that light had to be a particle, because if it were a wave, increased brightness would have caused a spark. But if light came in distinct quantized particles with distinct energy, each photon could knock out an electron and initiate a spark. So we are left with a truly mind-bending conundrum. Young's double-slit experiment had proved, without a doubt, that light acted like a wave. And yet the photoelectric effect showed, without a doubt, that the photon was a particle. And since a wave is nothing like a particle, and a particle is nothing like a wave, that's a huge problem. It's as if the photon were both a wave and a particle. There's a good chance you've heard at least a little bit about this conundrum, but the next story is not often told, and it's perhaps the most mind-blowing one of all. There's a way to do the double slit experiment, but with the brightness of the light turned down so much that if light were a photon, only one photon would be emitted at a time. I should tell you that I'm describing a modern version, as it more definitively demonstrates the weirdness. So if photons are waves, then what you'd expect is that each photon goes through both slits, and that the waves will interfere in the way that Young found and hit the distant scene, screen. Each photon would give just a very dim contribution. But as you added up more and more and more photons, you'd eventually end up with the same interference pattern that Young found over 200 years ago. And if the photon acted like a particle, what you'd see is the photon would appear in one spot at the distant screen, just like a BB hitting the wall. So let's watch this demonstration to see what we see. Remember that we can't see the photon while it's crossing the system. We just know that a photon is emitted, and we can see where it hits the wall. And the answer is? we see the photon hits the wall in a single spot. So that looks a lot like the particle explanation is right. But not so fast. Let's send another photon. OK, that shows up at a spot as well. More evidence for the particle answer. OK, so let's now still let photons through one at a time. 
but effectively speed up time. Let's see what happens when we watch hundreds, thousands, and then millions of photons hit the screen. So what we see is a very weird thing. Well, photons hit the screen one at a time, they don't hit everywhere on the screen. There are places where there are lots of photons hit the screen and places where none of them hit the screen. And after we send tons of photons through the system, we see the Young double slit distribution. The photons end up looking like a wave pattern. So let's think about what that means. It seems that wave physics governs how photons travel, but they're detected like particles. I'll say that again because it's so bizarre and so important to our understanding how the world works. Wave physics governs how photons travel, but they're detected as particles. There's been an absolute ton written about this very bizarre state of affairs. Some people propose what are called pilot waves, which kind of carry photons along like surfers on the beaches of Hawaii, but that doesn't seem to work. The best regarded explanation is truly hard to get your head around. The idea is that the motion of photons is governed by waves. In fact, the waves are thought to describe probabilities. And when we detect the particle, the wave collapses instantaneously. There's more to say on this, but I think we should defer that until I've talked about the quantum mechanics of electrons and atoms. The story of the quantum theory of matter starts with the turn of the century, the 20th century that is. English physicist J.J. Thompson had discovered the electron and thought that he'd understood what an atom looked like. He imagined that electrons were small and compact objects with negative electric charge, and they were embedded in a massless and positively electrically charged goo. His model was called the plum pudding model, with electrons standing in for the plums and the goo standing in for the pudding. Thompson's vision of the atom was considered to be a reasonable idea for a little over a decade until 1911, when his former student, a New Zealand physicist, Ernest Rutherford, shot a form of radiation called alpha particles at a foil of gold and saw that some of the alpha particles bounced back. It's hard to imagine Thompson's goo reflecting anything, so the plum pudding model got ruled out. Rutherford used his data and came up with something approaching a modern model of the atom, with all of the positive charge gathered together at the center of the atom and with the electrons swirling around that nuclear core, what scientists call a nucleus now, at relatively large distances. Rutherford's model of the atom looked very much like a solar system with a nuclear sun and planetary electrons. There's only one problem. Well, as we'll see, there are many problems, but one big problem is that the theory of classical electromagnetism that we talked about in the previous lecture said that Rutherford's idea was totally impossible. And here's the reason. Classical electromagnetism explains in very specific detail what happens when an electric charge is accelerated. And if an electron is orbiting a nucleus, it's constantly being accelerated towards the nucleus. Classical electromagnetism predicts that an accelerated charge will emit electromagnetic radiation. Basically, it gives off electromagnetic energy like radio waves. And if the electron is giving off energy, then that means it's losing energy. And if it loses energy, it will spiral down into the nucleus of the atom. And the whole process will take place in about 16 trillionths of a second. Since we know that electrons don't spiral down into the nucleus, that, as they say, is a problem. Thus, it could have been that Rutherford's theory was dead on arrival. Well, actually, it kind of was. Even Rutherford knew about the problem, and he was confident that somehow somebody would figure out the answer. There was another problem with the Rutherford atom. Rutherford didn't say much about the electrons swirling around the nucleus. Presumably, they could orbit near the nucleus, or very far away, or anywhere in between. And when the electrons moved from one orbit to the other, they had to change their energy, and they would therefore emit electromagnetic radiation. It turns out that for a lot of atoms, the electromagnetic energy they would emit would be in the form of visible light. Given that there were no constraints on the orbits of the electrons, that means that when they changed from one orbit to another, there were no constraints on the wavelength of light they would emit. That means that when we look at a glowing gas, that all colors should be present. However, that's not what we see when we look at a glowing gas. 
If we take that light and we run it through a prism, we see that only certain colors exist. Take a look at this spectrum here. This one happens to be hydrogen. We see that it emits only four distinct colors, a purplish one, a purplish blue one, a turquoise greenish one, and one that's red. Just four colors. And if you really squint, you might see another very faint, very hard to see deep purple one. While the colors are different for other elements, the qualitative observation was the same for them. Hot gases emit only certain colors of light. This observation is totally not explained by the Rutherford model, and if the Rutherford model was going to stand, it needed something to explain these discrete spectra. So it was about two years later, in 1913, when Danish physicist Niels Bohr made an utterly revolutionary suggestion. Basically, what he did was embrace the Rutherford model, and then he made an additional assumption. What he did was simply say that the electrons flying around the nucleus of an atom orbited in a series of fixed orbits, which he labeled 1, 2, 3, etc. According to this hypothesis, the electron could jump between orbits, but never exist in between them. Each orbit would have a different and fixed energy, and that means that when an electron changed from one orbit to another, the energy the photon emitted would come in discrete chunks. For instance, if an electron moved from the second orbital to the first orbital, it would release the energy equal to the difference in the energy of the two orbitals. Another important feature is that because all electrons had to exist in an orbital, once electrons moved to the first orbital, they could not lose any more energy. That's because the first orbital had the lowest energy. This feature protected the atom against electrons radiating energy and spiraling down into the nucleus. This idea that there were fixed orbits also explained why hot gases emitted light at fixed wavelengths. Since electrons could only transition between a set of discrete orbits, that means there were only fixed energies that photons could have. So at least qualitatively speaking, this explains the whole spectrum thing. It took a little work, but Bohr was actually able to predict the spectrum of hydrogen essentially perfectly. That means he was on to something. Of course, Bohr's model is entirely ad hoc. There was absolutely no reason to suppose he's right. But it was a neat idea, and it explains some of the qualitative observations. But it needed a real motivating explanation. And that explanation took quite a long time. But in 1924, French physicist Louis de Broglie had an idea. He was well aware of the confusing and ongoing conversation in the scientific community about the nature of the photon. Was it a particle or was it a wave? Well, de Broglie wondered about the electron. Maybe the electron had a wave nature, too. The fact that a particle could be a wave was really a pretty revolutionary idea. I mean, it wasn't totally out of the blue. After all, the question of whether subatomic objects were waves or particles was definitely a common topic of conversation among the top flight researchers at the time. But it was still an unorthodox idea. Maybe it was because de Broglie was a younger physicist that helped him think outside the box. In any event, he proposed the idea in his PhD thesis in 1924. If the electron was like a photon, and it was both a particle and a wave, well, then the way to prove that was to demonstrate that electrons could interfere with one another. This was accomplished by scattering electrons off of crystals. So while the wave nature of the electron was pretty mind-blowing, it did have one very positive aspect. It explained the Bohr atom. Remember that Bohr's model of the atom had a series of energy levels that were discrete. But Bohr's model didn't explain, while de Broglie's idea made everything clear. The idea is the following. If an electron is a wave and it has to fit in an orbit surrounding an atom, the wave must then fit in the orbit. That means the orbit must be a fixed number of wavelengths. The first orbital would fit one wave, the second orbit would fit two, the third three, and so on. These pictures here show you what I'm talking about. So while Bohr's idea of a particle electron didn't explain his model, de Broglie's wave model did. The subatomic world really did seem to require a blend of particles and waves. Our final tale of the unification of particles and waves came from an offhand remark from Dutch physicist Peter Debye. When he heard about the de Broglie hypothesis that the electron was also a wave, he noted that there should be a wave equation that described its behavior. This passing thought led Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger to invent, uh, in 1925, what is now called the Schrödinger equation. 
We're not going to even try to work with the equation, but you can see it here. The psi term describes the particle and its kinematic properties. The H, with a hat over it, is a way of extracting the energy of the particle. And, of course, the term on the right is the partial derivative with respect to time of the psi function, which, if the situation is static, is also the energy. This compact equation is the explanation for all of atomic physics and all of chemistry. It's worth spending a moment talking about how this equation has such a huge impact on chemistry. For instance, I'd like to remind you of the periodic table. The elements are arrayed in this two-dimensional grid. Each column contains elements that are chemically similar. For instance, the leftmost column contains hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. These are all highly reactive substances. In contrast, the rightmost column, consisting of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, are all noble gases, and they don't interact at all. This wasn't understood when the periodic table was invented in the mid-1800s. But Schrodinger's equation tells us how the electrons are located around the nucleus. The reason that the columns have similar properties is because each column has a similar configuration of outermost electrons. For example, in the case of the leftmost column, the reason that these chemicals are so reactive is that they have a single electron that can participate in chemical reactions. In the case of hydrogen, the atom has a single electron, while sodium has 11 electrons. However, for sodium, all the electrons except one are bundled up tightly in a non-interacting configuration, leaving just one to interact. And this basic explanation can be generalized to all of the columns. Quantum mechanics, culminating in Schrodinger's equation, is an accomplishment that explained and unified a century of chemical knowledge and more. So, for the final moments of this lecture, I draw your mind back to the abstract idea of the Schrodinger equation and draw your attention to this particular symbol, the Greek letter psi. It embodies all of our understanding of the electron in the atomic realm. Psi is what we call a wave function. The wave function describes the electron, both its location and its energy. If you solve the Schrodinger equation for a free particle, which just means a particle in an empty space with no nearby electric fields, the wave equation is just that, a wave wiggling up and down. However, in the vicinity of an atomic nucleus, the wave function takes on different shapes. Stealing some language from the Bohr atom, the two lowest energy orbitals are spherical, while the third is shaped like a dumbbell. Higher energy orbitals take on increasingly complicated shapes. But the shapes aren't as important as the physical significance of the wave function. So let's just pick the dumbbell-shaped one for purposes of illustration. We see the shape here. What does it mean? Well, you know, that's actually a very good question and one that still puzzles scientists. It could be that it describes where an electron is, but that doesn't seem to be quite right. Now, the, the reality is really pretty weird. Over the period of 1925 to 1927, Niels Bohr hosted at his institute in Copenhagen one of the other luminaries of the quantum period, a chap by the name of Werner Heisenberg. Together, they tried to figure out just what the wave function was. Their answer is now called the Copenhagen interpretation. What they proposed was that the wave function was related to the probability of finding an electron at a specific location. Technically, what they found was that if they squared the wave function, the result was the probability, but we'll not sweat that added technicality. Now, when I say that the wave function described the probability to find the electron at that location, you have an idea what that means. Kind of like if you have a fair die, you know that it has a 16% chance that you'll roll a 6. And it would be great if that's how it worked in the quantum world, but it's not. Instead, it seems as if the electron is actually simultaneously everywhere that the wave function says it is. However, when you detect it, the location of the electron is found in a certain location with a probability determined by the square of the wave function. This is very reminiscent of Young's double-slit experiment of photons when the photon seemed to act like a wave when it was traveling and not being looked at, but instantly turned into a particle with a specific location when it was detected. Quantum mechanics underwent many other developments built on the many tests that were performed that allowed physicists to construct the theory. What I've tried to do here is to give you a sense of the overall historical progression and why we think what we do. 
So let me summarize the whole situation for you. From the period of about 1900 to say maybe 1930, physicists were terribly puzzled about the behavior of matter in the quantum realm. The familiar world of the continuous electric fields and continuous distributions of matter seemed not to apply. Instead, the world was discrete, with electrons surrounding atoms in fixed orbits. Probably even harder to accept is the idea that photons and electrons and the other denizens of the microcosm acted both like particles and waves. Even if you've heard this all before, this, if this doesn't confuse you, well, then you, you haven't been listening very well. It still confuses me. And it's not just you or me. The whole wave-particle thing has perplexed nearly a century of very smart people. However, whether we're perplexed or not, over that same century, people have been doing experiment after experiment, trying to find out where these ideas start to break down, and there's not a single measurement that does anything other than agree with these theories. Like it or not, quantum mechanics is here to stay.